Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cameras and Coffee, where today we're going to talk about the importance of printing your photography. It's not enough just to see your photography on your screen. It's important to also print it. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons why, uh, some of the best practices, and something I do to that really brings this practice to the next level to really help improve photography. It's worked for me and, and should be able to work for a lot of people. So when you print your photography, generally what you're doing is you're printing it after you've taken the photos by some amount of time, whether it's weeks or months. And that gives you a distance between when you took the photo and when you're printing it. It's easier to go back to a work that you worked on weeks or months ago and say, oh, that holds up, it's worth printing, or oh, that wasn't quite as good as I thought it was at the time, it's not worth printing. So the very act of printing your photography is a way that you can go back and verify that your work is holding up as well as you think it is at the moment that you take the photo. Right, Steinbeck? Yes. And there are a few different ways you can print a photo. You can print it out on a canvas print. I do that um, many years with my best photo of the year. You can print it out on a, um, just from a color printer at home or at work or professionally for significantly less money and hang it on your wall. That's always a good thing to do. You can print it out in a photo book, something like that. There's also a difference in the way that images look when they're printed. And when you have a printed image, you have your image here and light is reaching the image, bouncing off of it and then reaching your eyes. So you're seeing reflected light. If you only ever look at your images on your screen, you're seeing projected light. Reflected light makes images look different. And I, I couldn't tell you the science behind it or why, but it has to do with, um, the, the result rather I should say, is that the colors look different. The image sharpness looks different. And uh, also, um, computer screens are around 72 dpi, give or take. Printed images are around 300. Uh, you can go higher than that for some really high-end printing. Also, computer screens are three colors, red, green, and blue. Printed images are four at minimum, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Or you can uh, do six color printing now. I think there might also be an eight color. But six color adds a couple of different colors and I can't remember what they are off the top of my head. So when you print something in that way, you end up with better colors, even if it's just four color printing versus on a screen. Also, if you're using a lot of, of dark tones or if you're shooting black and white, having a black ink in your print is gonna give you a, a more honest representation of those tones than a computer screen will. So those are some really tangible benefits that when you print your images will let you see what really holds up and what's really good. The other thing that, one thing that I do every year, and I started this about 10 years ago now, is I just print out on a 12, in a 12 by 12 book, my best photos of the year. This is the, this year's book. And my photographic year starts November 1st and ends October 31st because that gives me the time to go through the photos I've taken in that year to pick my 20 best and get the books ordered so that I can send them as uh, Christmas gifts. So um, any photo taken within that time frame ends up you know, being potentially my best photo of the year. And so what I do going through the year is whenever I finish, I, I organize my photo folders by the day in the camera that I use because that helps me when I make my videos here on YouTube. And um, then when I finish a folder, I'll pick out a handful of the best photos, maybe just one if there's only one that I think is really good or maybe five if it was a really, really great day. Usually it's two to three photos per shoot. And I'll put those into a folder for the year that I call top 20. And at the end of my photographic year, I'll sit down and I'll start grouping those into 21 and more and one through 20. And then over the process of a handful of weeks, 
uh, usually two weeks, give or take, um, working on it every three or four days, I'll go from however many I took that year in the folder down to 20 that I think are really good and worth printing. So um, for one of the advantages to that also of having these books is that I can go back, and I do this about once a year or so, and I look at what I did the previous year. And what did my, what did my photography look like a year ago? And what was my best photo a year ago? What, which subjects was I taking that I was really pleased with? And so last year was a, a landscape photo, a photo th that was my favorite. What was 2018? I don't recall. Oh, 2018 was a photo of the Mustang under the Milky Way. 2020, we'll, we'll, we'll get to in a minute. If you want to see my entire 2020 top 20 album, there's a link to that in the video description and you can take a look at what the photos are that I was pleased with for this year. Um, at any rate, so, so having this printed record then, you can look through them every now and then and say, you know, a year ago, I was shooting this type of work and I'm doing it a little bit better today. There was, I can see a technical flaw in this that I did a year ago that I didn't do this year. Or I like the compositions this year better. Or this other type of work was not as good as last year or just the same as last year. It gives you the ability to look at your work over time and see what you're doing well. And so one of the things I realized in 2017, 2018 was that I wasn't pleased with how well my images were telling a story. So I started focusing on creating images that told a story about the subject. And uh, this year, I feel like a bunch of them did that. So printing your work is not just about getting to see it in print. It's not just about the differences that a printed image has over the um, uh, actual, o over the screen image. It's about having a record for yourself that you can compare, but it's also a very important practice because if you, if you pick out, and I pick out the top 20 because when I started doing this, I wanted to do my top 10. The smallest photo book I could get was 20 pages, so it turned out to be the top 20. And that's what it's been every year. When you sit down to do some photos, when you say, I'm gonna pick this number of photos that I took over the year, and I'm gonna print this number of them as my best, then what you are doing is forcing yourself to cull out all the mediocre photos. You're also then forcing yourself to, to cull out all of the really good photos that just aren't quite good enough to be in that top arbitrary number. And that practice teaches you to be better at judging your own work, to be better at your, being your own harshest critic, to be better at being honest with yourself about what works and what doesn't, where you can improve, where you need to improve and where you should focus your time, which all of us, it's limited, but where you should focus that to obtain the best improvement that you can in the coming year. And um, so I figured I would go through a handful of these photos that I thought turned out pretty well and um, talk about them a little bit because some of them, one of the things this year that I found was that I had more photos of people than I have in any year in the past. And um, more or more photos had people in them. And that was something that I set about to do after last year's book, where I had a couple of portraits that turned out really well. And two years ago where I had basically none, um, realizing I wanted to photograph people more. But at any rate, uh, also, when I do these, I look at, am I doing more digital or more film that's, that's turning out well? And consistently, it's about half and half every year. So at any rate, you um, can start looking at some of those, those things, some of those trends in your images, and see what you really want to focus on. So here's a shot that I took in, in Chapala, Mexico on the Malacan. And I had my, well, I don't own it anymore, but I had the Canon F1N that I owned at the time and a Cosina 28 millimeter 2.8 on it. And pretty sure that's 400H film. And I was just sitting there taking a break from walking around and I saw this guy riding his bike up 
along the Malacon. So I just grabbed the camera, set it in my lap, framed it so that it would be roughly level. I was not looking through the viewfinder. I completely shot this blind from the hip, waited until I thought he was in frame and pushed the shutter. I ended up having to adjust that image by about a degree and a half to get the horizon level, but that's pretty darn close to what the original negative looked like. Um, this shot here is of Browns Creek Falls, and it's a simulated long exposure with the A7S II and the Yashica 4517, I think. It's, looks like the Yashica. Uh, looks like an image from the Yashica, at any rate. So that was one of my hikes this summer, and it was a very fun waterfall to photograph because it had a very good water flow. Um, this shot's another simulated long exposure with the Pentax K1 and the Irix 15 at Lake Hayaha. Um, obviously have not been up there since the fires, so I don't know whether or not that lake was affected by them. Here's a shot of a BNSF train uh, with the Pentax K1 and IRX 15. It was flying past. This is a northbound train south of Denver and uh, on the lines that go through the Greenland open space for those of you who are, know the area. And these northbound trains coming out of the coal plant from Colorado Springs just shoot up these lines very fast. So in the time that this train was uh, in frame where I could get shots with the, the K1's fast burst mode of 6.3 seconds, I was able to, uh, 6.3 frames per second. I was able to get four shots of the train that had some semblance of suitable framing. This was the best of them. Uh, in the time that it took me to take one second's worth of shots, it went from where that last visible coal car is to the front engine being outside of the frame. It was really moving. Um, this next shot's another long exposure simulation with the Pentax K1 and the IRX 15 and uh, was taken on Mount Sherman when I was a little bit lost up there on my way down. Couldn't quite figure out where the trail was. Uh, this happens sometimes when you're the last person off of a mountain. Uh, you don't know where everyone else walked and you can't just follow them. Uh, the shot of the Jeep was taken with the A7S II and um, the Fun Leader 18 millimeter. We were coming down from Pomeroy Lakes after a thunderstorm rolled in, oh, right before it rolled in actually. We saw the lightning and thunder and said, you know what, let's get back below tree line. And um, this guy in the Jeep Gladiator had the same idea. So as they passed us going down the hill, I just grabbed my, the, the camera and knelt and um, took that shot. And uh, yes, they were pretty close to us. Uh, this next shot I'm going to show you was taken also was taken in Hokotepec, Mexico, also with the F1N and a 50 millimeter FDN 1.8 on ADOX CMS 22. I forget if it was 12 or 20 ISO for this shot. Um, not much work done in post here. What I what there it was a fairly dim day, but the light that was coming in was reflecting off of the tiles, which you can see in the front of the image, up to the crucifix. And so what I did was I took a meter reading off of the, the Jesus figure. And this was recessed a little bit into a building in the foyer of like an apartment building. It was a little um, shrine that was in that apartment uh, building. I think it was, I think it was an apartment. So I took a meter reading off of the uh, chest of the Jesus on the crucifix and then just said, let's have that be the middle tone. Let everything else fall into place. And then I underexposed it a stop because I was hand holding and even at whatever aperture this was, um, I forget for sure, probably around two or two eight, this was handheld at about a quarter of a second exposure. So if I had properly exposed it, uh, it would have been a half second exposure, completely undoable. So pretty happy with how that shot turned out and primarily that's straight out of the camera. And then this last shot was my best shot for the year. And again, Pentax K1, IRX 15 millimeter. This is uh, the Milky Way over Trapper's Lake Lodge. And you can tell if you're eagle-eyed over on the left in the middle of the image that the stars are distorted. And that's a sign that this is two frames that are stacked. And the, the Milky Way is one frame, and then the Trapper's Lake foreground is another. If you've seen my time-lapse video, that video shows how 
the frames for, in, for a time lapse that this frame was part of were taken. And this was just um, one frame that, that I really happened to like the composition of. And the, uh, after I made this image, what I did was I masked out the water and then I copied the um, sky layer into a new layer, placed it over the water, uh, remade it just a little bit, re, uh, redid the geometry just a little bit. And then I did, um, uh, I forget exactly what the opacity was on the water layer, maybe like 30%. In real life, the water would, would absorb way more light than this. There would not have been this much uh, reflection off of it. So, um, but this was the image that I wanted to create, and that's what I did. So, um, at any rate, I strongly recommend. It. Now, I will say that the 12 by 12 books are a little bit spendy. Um, they originated because I had a whole bunch of gift cards for one of the companies that prints those and I got them for free the first year and I said I'm going to do this again next year and they are now running around about $150 per book for this size um, with gift cards and coupons or groupons whatever a little bit less but they're still about 110 so it is uh, my, a big very nice annual Christmas gift for myself and the a couple of other people who get them. But at any rate, the thing that I want you to take away from this whole video is printing your images gives you a better idea of the type of work you're doing, it gives you a better understanding of what works and what doesn't. And often you will see errors in images when you print them that you didn't see on your screen. It's just a factor of the way that people look at printed images versus on screen images. And then of course, having a record that goes back through many, many years will give you the ability to sit down and look at your photographic progression over time. And also, it's, a, it's always a good record of seeing how your life has changed over that time and the people who have come in and out of it. And it, it's, um, so it's, it's, it serves a lot of good benefits. And so for those of you who have never printed your images or who don't make a habit out of it, I definitely strongly recommend setting up a practice every year of sitting down and saying, what is my best work for this past year? And then printing some number of those images in some format so that you can see them and hold them and then think critically about them and go through the whole practice of, of improving your work in that way. So at any rate, this was uh, cameras and coffee for today. And if you guys print your images, by all means, please let me know what you think of the practice of printing your own work and how you go about it, what formats you print in, um, whether it's books or canvas prints or things like that, whether you print your own work in your own dark room, and what advantages you think printing your images has over simply seeing them on a computer screen. So until next time, everybody, have a good day.